In this last video, we are going to discuss the rules for asymptotic analysis. These rules are followed for most asymptotic functions, including big O. The first rule is the rule of addition or independence. And what this rule says is, if there are multiple snippets of code which are independent of each other in your program, the total complexity is the sum of all the individual snippets. So here we have an example where we have a program that has two loops which are independent of each other. And what I mean by independent is once the first loop ends, then the second loop starts, which is this is not inside of another loop. In that case, they would be dependent. So the first loop is running from 0 to n minus 1 or n times. The second one runs from 0 to m minus 1. And therefore, the individual complexities of this particular segment would be O of n, and of this one would be O of m. And if we were to analyze the total complexity of the program Tn, we could basically sum O of n with O of m to get this equation. And this could be further simplified to O of n plus m. The second rule that we are going to discuss is the drop constant multipliers rule. So let's say I have the same code, but instead now both of the loops are running from 0 to n, n minus 1, which is this one is running O of n times, and the second one is also running O of n times. In such a case, the total time complexity would be O of 2n, which is O of n plus O of n is O of 2n. And this could be further simplified to O of n. So we basically drop this constant. Now one point to remember here is that we drop constants which are even very large. Like even if we had a million as a constant, we would drop it. So think about this for a second. Like if you have two different functions, like one is this 100 or 100,000 or 1 million times n, and the other one is a function 0. 0.0001, but this time it's n square. So which of them will run faster? A lot of you might think like, oh, this is a big number and it might run faster, but the correct answer is actually this one. And the reason why is because if we plot the graph for these two functions, while this one would be kind of a linear graph, which is like we are plotting y equal to a million n and uh, it might be displaced by this constant value while the second graph which is quadratic in nature although it will be smaller for or it will be below this other graph for i can use some other color maybe for this one while it will be smaller or it will grow slowly for small values at a certain instance when n gets very large this is going to overtake the other graph and it will at certain point which is n naught which we discussed in the previous video this graph will overtake the the performance of the entire program because again like this is quadratic and the other one is linear the third rule is the rule of different input variables this is the rule that most students lose a lot of points on throughout this course because what they do is they try to simplify the programs. So let's say in this case we have, this is the same code I'm using for the first rule, which is the program is running from 0 to n minus 1 and this one is running from 0 to l minus 1. So the total complexity would be again O of n plus O of l by rule 1. Now you cannot simplify this n plus l to something like o of n or o of l until and unless there are relationships given between n and l which is if in the program you are given something like n is much less than l or l is much less than n so let's say if it was n is much less than l so l would be the dominating term and this could be simplified to o of l and in this case, if this was the relationship, this could be actually simplified to O of n. 
But if nothing is given to you in the question, or if you don't explicitly state that what is the relationship between these two cases, which is I am assuming that L is much smaller than N, you cannot simplify this term. And you, you are going to lose a lot of points. Even in the projects, a lot of students I see what they do is they just say the complexity is O of N or O of L without describing what the variable is. So you have to always state that N is something, which is what is N? We do not know what the what is N in the program. So you have to state your assumption or whatever is given in the program, which is N is the size of input or uh, S is the length of the string or something like that. But if you just state O of N or anything like that, uh, unless the programs are like this simple, but like let's say in your project, you might be building multiple functions. And if you don't state what is N, L, we, we are not going to know what it is and you're going to lose a majority of your points. The final rule is the rule of dropping lower order terms. So we had already seen that different functions grow in different ways. Some of them are very fast compared to others. In this case, uh, I have this, like again, two different loops. The first one is running from zero to n minus one. So the complexity is O of n. The other one is running from j equal to zero to m. The complexity is O of m. Oh, but uh, in this one, actually, the loop is running from zero to m, but it's growing much faster because it's uh, growing like exponentially, which is you are multiplying the number by two at every iteration. So how the numbers would look like for this particular loop would be something like uh, zero, uh, two, actually there's a typo here. It should be, this should run from one to m because otherwise there will be no multiplication. So we have one, two, four, eight, 16, and this will go up till the number m. Now this, entire series you're going to see a lot uh, like this is again like you're going to see this a lot even in certain programs uh, I'm going to simplify this right now because uh, this is a series that you might be uh, taught in uh, the previous uh, discrete math course which is basically you can simplify this as 2 to the power 0 2 to the power 1 2 to the power 2 2 to the power 3 and this goes on till two to the power, like I'm assuming that the number of iterations is actually equal to K, which is in this case, the number of iterations is N because the loop is running uh, N times, but in this case, the loop won't be running uh, M times. It's doubling, the value is doubling. So I'm assuming that the number of iterations is K and this is the value we are trying to calculate or use. So in this case, you can see like in the first iteration, the value that we are getting, the loop will run two to the power zero. Uh, uh, the value of uh, J would be two to the power zero. In the second iteration, it would be two to the power one. The fourth, uh, for the fourth, it uh, for the third iteration. So this is like first iteration, second iteration, th third iteration, fourth iteration. You can see this one has a relationship between like one and zero, the, the exponent, which is zero here is basically one here. So you can add one to the exponent and that's how we get, uh, like if there are k iterations, like if we are assuming that we have k iterations, then this formula by intuition, like if you can see this, if this one maps to zero, two maps to one, three maps to two, four maps to three. So what would K map to? K would actually map to K minus one. And we know that this two K minus one is actually less than or equal to M because in this case, the loop is running M times. Now we can take the log of this number on both sides. So I'm going to do some math here, which is uh, I'm going to erase the left half maybe, or I can just like write it here, which is log two to the power K minus one is equal to log M. Now by a rule in 
lo logarithmics, which is just a second. If I have something like log a with base uh, to the power b, I can rewrite this as b log a, right? So I can rewrite the statement as k minus one log of two. Now this is already base two because all logarithms in computer science are base two because we are dealing with binary numbers. Uh, at the end, we are we have everything in binary. So we have something like this. And this log two base two can be simplified to one because if you have this log of a and a, this actually is one. So you basically get this value, which is k minus one is equal to log two of m. And k is equal to one plus log two of m. Now again, by the rule of dropping constants, which is rule number two, we can drop this one. So basically the time complexity of this loop would be O of log base two m. Now again, by the rule of addition, we can add these two complexities, which is O of n plus O of log base two m. And this could be further simplified to O of n. And why is that? Because logarithms go grow much slower than uh, linear functions. So if you have a very complex program and uh, you have like multiple big O notation representations of different code snippets, you can, you can remove or drop all of the lower order functions. This was the fourth rule. You have, to rule, you have to make use of all these rules together in your program analysis throughout the course. So we are going to do a lot more problems uh, on like this type of analysis in Monday's problem solving lecture. The final thing I want to state before we end uh, today's uh, class is the fact that whenever we are talking about algorithms, one thing we missed today when we were trying to uh, go over time complexity is the fact that uh, there are three different cases which we are trying to understand, which is what would be the best case, what would be the average case, and what would be the worst case. So what I mean by that is like, let's say if you are trying to have an array that has some numbers, which has one, two, 15, 11, 23, and if you are trying to find a number like 15 in this array, so a best case, like the, the, this is a simple problem of linear search. So in the best case, what we can do is if we are write, writing a program that runs from I zero to the size of this array, the best case would be we get the value on the first instance itself. So if there's a match on the first value, uh, we have the lowest particular cost and hence we have the best case. The second, uh, case uh, which is uh, usually used is the average case where we find this value somewhere in the middle. And the third one is the worst case where the number in this case, like number 15 might not exist in the array. So we traverse each of the elements of the array, but we still don't find it. Now these three cases, best case, average case, and worst case are independent of the notations that we have stated so far in the course, which is O, omega and theta. So what I mean by that, there's going to be a best case, average case and worst case for each of the notations. Like these two are absolutely independent, which is they could be, whenever we are thinking about the data to a program, we are going to think about scenarios, which is uh, what if the numbers are sorted? So that could be an example of the, the algorithm might be working in the best case, the numbers are sorted or something like that. And in that case, you are going to get different recurrence relations or different uh, these uh, symbolic equations based on our perception of what the best case or the solution provided to the algorithm is. So there's going to be like best, worst, and average for O, best, worst, and average for uh, sigma and so on, which is you, you basically are 
told that you have this algorithm, you're going to think about what would be the best case that this algorithm runs in, what would be the average case. And then we are going to state, oh, what is big O for the best case in this case? What is big O for the worst case? Uh, and typically in the whole entire course, if you are not given what you are supposed to do, which is calculate the best case, worst case, or um, average case, you have to assume that we are talking about O of worst case in all situations, which is because this is the most common one because we want to see how our algorithm performs in the worst to worst scenario. So we want to understand what is the upper bound of time in the worst case. So I would definitely recommend you this reading, which is the open DSA 8.10. It's just a one page reading. It tells you why these two things, this mathematical terms uh, or these mathematical notations are independent of this best, worst and average case. It's a great reading. Uh, again, like there's also another question, uh, one of them, which is how do uh, O and theta or omega relate to each other. Again, like you can read these. Uh, these were some of the interesting readings I found. Uh, and in Monday's video, we are going to do a lot more problems on big O. So that's pretty much it for today's lecture.